There were signs today in China that a major purge is ahead in the Communist Party. A party commission called for punishment, including expulsion of members who supported ousted party leader Cao Ziyang. More from Eric Enberg in Beijing. The message from the meeting that shook up the communist leadership, which today was being carefully spoon-fed to China's man on the street, was clear. Political reform is now a dead issue here. And Deng Xiaoping, the 84-year-old supreme leader, is more firmly in control than ever. Party propaganda organs unfurled bold red headlines to trumpet his latest victory. Care was taken to get the word out to the army, which made the victory possible. The new party boss, Zhang Jimin, is less than a household name. In China, the uh, characteristics of a leader uh, may not be known by common people. All these things are decided in top level, not us. <laughs> Zhang, often described as a colorless bureaucrat who ran China's economic capital, Shanghai, was known mostly for his smooth way with foreigners, a skill that will be useful now that so many foreigners and their money have been scared away. Some Western observers believe Deng has handled this purge adroitly. The unknown Zhang does not strengthen any ideological fashion, nor the army, which wanted a general to get the job. But Zhang may have been simply a default choice. Sources say better-known candidates ducked the job, which has changed hands three times in three years. With the heart of the city under tight control, authorities clearly feel the time is ripe to launch a full-scale attack on the intellectuals who provided the fire for the democracy movement. By night, the campuses belong to the security apparatus, which is using midnight searches, random arrests, and other proven tactics of a police state to stamp out a student movement that is now thoroughly terrorized. Eric Engberg, CBS News, Beijing. Greek Premier Andreas Papandreou, who is suffering from pneumonia, has developed heart and kidney problems. The 70-year-old Papandreou faces a deadline this week to try to form a new coalition government. His Socialist Party lost last week's election. The government may be greatly underestimating the AIDS crisis. The General Accounting Office says in a new report today that up to 485,000 Americans will have the disease by the end of 1991. That's a third more than federal health estimates. The GAO calls for government surveys of sexual behavior. This is Gay Pride Weekend. Parades in several cities mark the 20th anniversary of a riot in New York City, which to many marks the beginning of the modern gay rights movement. The biggest parade was probably in San Francisco, where estimates of the number of marchers went as high as 250,000. A Newsweek poll out this weekend found that 65% of those asked disagree with last week's Supreme Court ruling that burning the American flag is a lawful act. And Congress is making an unusual effort to take matters into its own hands. Ron Allen reports. There is growing sentiment that the Supreme Court was wrong when it ruled that burning the American flag is a constitutionally protected form of freedom of speech. Just days after that decision, there is talk of a rare constitutional amendment to reverse it. I believe that this opinion will be reversed. I believe that is an absolutely fallacious and incorrect interpretation of our Constitution. Free speech doesn't permit you to paint swastikas on synagogues. It doesn't permit you to deface the Lincoln Monument. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it should permit you to burn the American flag. On Friday, the Senate passed legislation that makes desecration Mr. of the Stevens. flag unlawful. The House will consider similar resolutions this week. Despite the passionate argument taking place, some lawmakers want to resist tampering with the First Amendment, perhaps the most hallowed amendment to the Constitution. Anything that touches on freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of religion should be uh, undertaken with the greatest care and, and concern. Legal scholars also argue that the role of the justices is undermined by amending the Constitution to change publicly unpopular Supreme Court decisions. The primary function of a court like ours, which is insulated from day-to-day -day political and public pressures, is to resist the winds of moment-to-moment -moment passion and moment-to-moment -moment public feeling. But lawmakers are not insulated from those same pressures, and the public's passion against flag burning will likely endure. Congress is expected to hold hearings very soon to consider ways to respond to the high court's ruling. Ron Allen, CBS News, Washington.
So far tonight, we've been bringing you news of the world around us. Now we have news of the incredible world inside us. On Inside Sunday, developments in biotechnology, advancements that have the potential to change lives through the very building blocks of life, the genes. Genes determine what we are. And now, David Dow reports, they're telling scientists what we may be. Katrina Del Rosario is just beginning life, but already her mother worries about her future, that a family history of diabetes may someday surface in the infant. A few miles away, research is underway that could answer Del Rosario's concerns and alert others to their prospects for cancer and thousands of other diseases that may be linked to heredity. It is one segment of the Human Genome Project, a vast effort to map man's entire genetic system. It's essentially like having an encyclopedia of man. In principle, we'll know the complete set of instructions which make people. Those instructions determine everything from hair color to height and are found in each of the body cells of every person. They are locked in strings of chromosomes in the 100,000 genes they contain. Scientists hope to learn the location of all 100,000, including the ones that make people sick. If you know the name and address of the gene, you can go right to the gene, you can try to figure out what is wrong with the gene, how is it different, and maybe learn also from the problem in the gene, what's the best avenue of treatment. Mapping the entire genome could take 15 years and $3 billion and produce a whole new approach to medicine. Even scientists have uh, gotten carried away and called it uh, the book of man and words to that effect, the holy grail I've seen. But such a bold quest raises ethical issues as well, concerns that these children could grow up to a brave new world dictated by genetics. Employers, insurance companies will be tempted to start picking people on the basis of their genes. Judith Margheim and daughter Lindy see the project through different eyes. They've watched three family members suffer with Huntington's disease, a devastating neurological disorder triggered by a gene scientists may soon pinpoint. I think it's the, the, the element of hope that, uh, that the, we have. Mapping the genome won't be easy. The machines to do it are still evolving. Machines to match that most complex machine of all, the human body. David Dow, CBS News, Los Angeles. As scientists learn more about genes and what they do, they're also learning how genes can be altered through biotechnology. At this very moment, in fact, a genetic experiment is underway that could one day save your life. On a quiet surgical ward near Washington, D.C., scientists at the National Institutes of Health are making medical history. For the first time, researchers are transferring an altered gene into human patients, a procedure once restricted to plants and lab animals. It's an early step on the road to what scientists hope will someday be gene therapy, manipulating genetics to fight heart disease, cancer, or AIDS. This represents a different kind of approach to the treatment of human disease. It represents an approach in which we change the very genetic makeup of the patients themselves. In this pioneering experiment, the altered gene is being inserted into cancer-fighting white blood cells, which are then injected into a patient. The gene itself won't actually benefit the patient. It will simply act as a marker to help scientists track the white blood cells' progress in fighting the cancer. Nothing that we're doing now is, is, is even therapy. It's just the very first steps in, in understanding how to use genes for the treatment of disease. But if all goes well, the truly big step will come next year when scientists hope to give cancer-fighting cells much more than a marker gene. We're modifying those cells so that we can track where they go in the body and then hopefully within the next year uh, to introduce genes that can increase their ability to fight the cancer. All this progress is leading critics to ask where we're headed. Genes are what define us, what make each person unique. Some fear that genetic manipulation could someday move beyond fighting disease to tampering with human features as basic as hair color or intelligence. If you have the power to change certain features, why not uh, move towards changing those genes as well? Will we be able to, to say, leave some genes alone? But for now, scientists by and large agree such research is off limits. 
and genetic manipulation in humans is still tightly controlled. The experiment at NIH required approval from eight federal agencies, and only 10 terminally ill patients will receive the altered genes. I feel there needs to be very firm safeguards to ensure that gene transfer is never used except in the treatment of serious disease. Experimenting with genes isn't limited to human life. Plant genes are also being altered. And as Christine Negroni reports, scientists have now come up with a way to produce a plant that is actually insect resistant. In a greenhouse in St. Louis, they're growing a tomato with a difference. The difference is it's a tomato plant that kills bugs before the bugs can kill the plant. Leaves from the plants that have our protein in them are quite resistant to the caterpillar. By genetically altering this plant, scientists at the Monsanto company have put a naturally occurring pesticide inside every one of its cells. They've taken a gene from a bacteria that's poisonous to worms and made it a permanent part of the tomato's genetic makeup. It's catastrophic for caterpillars. But Monsanto says it will be great news for farmers looking for alternatives to chemical pesticides. We'll save the farmer time and money and we'll produce a product that will have significantly positive environmental impact. Plants that kill bugs may please farmers, but a positive impact on the environment, environmentalists say, maybe not. Our concern is that we not go from the frying pan into the fire, that we not take on a new technology that has its own set of risks and, uh, and downside. The downside is a crop of questions yet to be answered. Federal agencies are still testing the plant's effect on the people who eat it, but the environmentalists fear no one can know the long-term consequences of this almost science fiction-like technology. We're not talking about tomatoes that are going to walk across the field. We're talking about tomatoes that resist insects. It's an idea Monsanto is not alone in pursuing. By the mid-1990s, half a dozen companies hoped to have genetically designed plants that might solve farmers' problems from the inside out. Farmers are waiting. Well, we're stuck in the middle trying to produce a quality product and depend on the chemical companies to uh, give us a product to do that with. Companies that make bug-killing plants think they have the answer for farmers looking for alternatives to insects and insecticides. Environmentalists just hope that in the rush for solutions, their concerns won't be plowed under. Christine Negroni, CBS News, St. Louis. And one final note on biotechnology. Scientists tell us they expect that one day, every newborn baby will leave the hospital with his own personal genetic map. The map will indicate ailments to which he may be prone. That will allow him to adjust his lifestyle to minimize the risk. Before we leave you tonight, we want to take note of an unusual sporting event. It took place off the coast of Florida. What is unusual is that until today, the sport in question was thought to exist only in the mind of young lovers. Victoria Corderi reports. Welcome to the submarine races. You heard right, the submarine races. And that's an old line boys gave you when you were a teenager. Let's go watch the submarine races. When I was a kid, I was too shy to invite anybody to submarine races, so I figured it was my last shot at it. This, however, is the real thing. 19 teams from all over the country in a wide variety of weird-looking human-powered submarines. It's a sport that everybody should see, I mean, at least once. <laughs> Trouble is, the race was pretty tough to see even once. From shore, it looked like this. Spectators got their only chance to see this first-time event from a small monitor. I think it's watching turtles. <laughs> we just see the boats going out. We don't know who's winning or who's losing. The winner gets $5,000, but most of the contestants are not in it for the money. This 74-year-old, the oldest entrant, had his own reasons for wanting to test his clear plastic bubble. Uh, I've had this thing about a sphere going through uh, fluid for about 15 years. Okay, but most others who are racing more conventional-looking subs are teams of engineering students who created the contraptions as senior projects. It's better than making a soda dispenser by far. The view underwater wasn't much more exciting than the one from land. The subs are racing against time, and for several of them, time stood still once they got in the water. In the end, rain forced the organizers to cancel the finals. 
disappointing dozens of daring young dreamers with their diving machines. Victoria Quideri, CBS News, Riviera Beach. And that's our news. Dan Rather will be here tomorrow night. And later tonight, Bill Plant with the CBS Sunday Night News. I'm Connie Chung in New York. I'll see you again next week. Thank you for joining us and for all of us at CBS News. Good night.